Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host today, Brian Broom, and I'm joined by Greg Uttinger. And today we're going to be talking about the dreaded them, the Mm. others, the inhumans, the (laughs) monsters that lurk under your bed and talk to you about things like cultural anthropology and uh, <laughs> such things as that. These these horrible monsters. In-groups, out-groups, tribalism. We'll probably talk about a lot of these kinds of things. So, Greg, why don't you draw us into the text, the <laughs> section of scripture we're looking in with that in mind? Well, with that in mind, uh, we're looking at 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, Elijah has gone on to heaven. Elisha has picked up his ministry, but we don't begin with either of them. We begin in Syria, Aram, the nation to the north, the them, the others, the bad guys, the invaders, pick a name. And name and captain of the host of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God that the Lord were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment, and brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith said Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive? This man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy. If I consider, I pray you, how he seeketh the quarrel against me. We'll stop there for a moment. The little girl here was one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. And unfortunately, from my point of view at least, we're not given her name, which probably in itself is, is significant. This is a little girl from a village somewhere in Israel the indication seems to be that she was not a special super saint, uh, wholly uh, un- in unusual in what she does. But what she does may seem to us very unusual. She's been she's been captured. Probably her family, if not captured, has simply been killed. Her city may have been burned. She's been plucked away from everything she knows, from her family, her city, her friends, uh, her way of life, and the formal worship of her god. And she has been installed in the home of this great Syrian general named Naaman, and has apparently managed to learn their language well enough to communicate, although Aramaic and Hebrew were not that different. Uh, But we're not told how old she is. She's a maiden, so she's probably youngish. A maiden could reach anywhere from 5 to 15 or 16, because somewhere in there, girls usually got married. She's a young girl. She's a little girl. And she notes that her master is a leper. Now, that meant more in Israel than it did here. In Israel, leprosy was a symbol for sin and the curse. And if you were a leper, you were excluded from the social and religious life of Israel. You lived outside the city walls. You couldn't have contact with anybody. If anyone even came close, you had to cry out unclean. Uh, couldn't go to, to temple or, or synagogue. You were among the living dead. And and the leprosy would scar your features as well. You wouldn't look like everyone else. Well, that didn't all apply here, but the, the last part certainly did. It, it was not a disease that that the, the cool people had, the trendy people, the important people. It would have hampered Na- Naaman in his, in his work and probably felt rather uncomfortable. We don't know exactly what the nature of this disease is. It's generally a skin disease. Um, but the little girl notes this and, and is sorry for Naaman, the man who in some degree is responsible for carrying her away from everything she knows. 
and making her a slave in his own house. But her gracious concern for him breaks out in an exclamation, oh, that he were with the prophet that's in Samaria, for the prophet could recover him of his leprosy. So the first amazing thing is that she has goodwill toward this man. It would be so easy to be bitter, angry, to consider this this man a, a monster, inhuman, a, an alien, one of them. But instead, she treats him as the image of God, as a, as a man she has come to care about, and she wishes him well. She wishes he could be healed. And she says so out loud. But, then she, but in the process, she says something else that's, that's also uh, surprising. Elisha had never healed a leper. No prophet had ever healed a leper. God had healed Miriam from her leprosy after giving it to her and Moses' intervention. And although there was this extensive ceremony for cleansing of lepers who had been healed so that they could be readmitted into, into Israeli life, there was no record that any prophet had ever done such a thing. Not for all, there were, there were many lepers in Israel, Jesus will say later of this event. But Elisha didn't heal any of them. And here's this little girl who's been captured by this, this foreign general and his troops saying, if he were there, he's a Gentile, he's an unbeliever, but I am absolutely sure that if he were the prophet, the prophet would do something that no prophet has ever done and heal him. Because she majors on the compassion and love of God in the midst of being taken away by them, by the aliens, by the monsters, by the outsiders. We, we can consider later the rest of the story, but this, this is our focus here. What is it about us that looks at the people across the tracks, as my parents' generation would say, or across the border or over the seas, and says them, the others? Uh, why is this so easy to foist upon humanity? Why does humanity so easily gobble it up? and look at the people outside of our immediate community as something else, something non-human, something that we just stick a label on, and having stuck that label, we don't really have to show them the love of God or, or respond to them as we respond to the people we, can, we consider human. Well, um, sin. <laughs> sin, yeah, and the word sin, yeah, there you go. See, Christianity has this real simple answer. But before we consider Christianity's answer a little more, I, I want to point out um, some things from, from cultural anthropology. Anthropology is supposed to be the science of humanity. Anthropos, man, logos, the wisdom of science word concerning. Uh, but modern anthropology is rooted in Western rationalism and Western theories of evolution. And so as anthropology was set about trying to fit various sorts of human-like things, past, present, and future, onto some kind of family tree or time scale or something, it had to decide, more or less, what is man? Good old biblical question. What is man? Uh, they, looked at the, they looked at the fossil record, because that had now become a thing. They looked around the world and saw culturally inferior people. They were culturally inferior because they didn't have flush toilets and steam power, basically. You know, we would look back now and say, well, you guys didn't have, don't have computers and spaceships. But at the time, the, the, the technology of the day seemed to sufficiently set modern man, so late 18, early 1900s, apart from everyone below that. Uh, also, just according to appearance, they looked out and saw that some people don't look like us. Their skin's a different color. Their eyes or their nose are, are, are funny. They're not, they're not like us. Um, and so they're obviously a different kind of humanity, if we're going to use that word. Uh, the, uh, the pattern, and I'm, I'm certainly no anthropologist, but I did a little reading. The, the traditional apparent order is 
the the fossil other, the savage other, the black other, and the ethnographic other. So look at the fossil record. Well, whatever those things were, they're not like us, so they weren't human. So we can distinguish ourselves, man, true humanity, from those things. And as the museums reconstructed humanoid things from the fossil record, they they amazingly managed to predict um, skin color, hair length, the way they dressed, the facial expressions that made them look stupid. Uh, because they, they they knew that these were inferior beings. So although the fossil record can't give you any of that, they nonetheless portrayed them like that because mm -hmm. of their presuppositions. They made them more ape-like, more deformed, even though there was nothing in the fossil record that actually said any of that. Certainly the fossil record does not tell you how one dresses. Unless in the fossil record you also find evidence of the tools they used to make the clothes they wore, at which point... We tend to ignore that and just go on with what we want to believe. Um, well, it's also so much easier to think of uh, human developmental history as as something where you're at the pinnacle of it. Right. Yeah. And so for those living, they they, they came up with the savage other. Um, the, the savage, of course, are those who live who are alive now or within recent history, but who do not have our technology, don't have anywhere near our technology. They, they still use stone knives and bear skins. Um, so they're obviously not where we are. And, and they may look like us. And you might be able to dress them up in a business suit. And for a little while, they might pass as one of us. But just watch their lifestyle. They're not us at all. And then, interestingly enough, the black other. Uh, it doesn't matter here that these black people may live in our society, may hold a job equal to ours, may be may pass IQ tests and standardized testing at our level, yet obviously, being black, they're more like gorillas than they are like us. Now, in the late, in the mid 20 let's see, we're in the early 21st century. Um, <clears throat> we look at that with horror. There was a time rightfully when this- so. <laughs> yeah, Rightfully so. There was a time when this was considered cutting edge science. There's um, a horrible line in Darwin, I think it's um, just into the species, where he bemoans the fact that at, at his time, <clears throat> there was modern man and there were the, 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 the very small primitive apes. But in between, there were black peoples and aborigines and gorillas, and he lumps them all together, as kind of an evolutionary stair step between the pure animal and the pure human. And he regretted that by the end of the, the century, he thought that hunters would simply wipe all these out. The gorillas and the aborigines alike would be hunted down and, and killed uh, for sport or whatever. Uh, and that, that would leave an even bigger gap before, but than before between man and the animals. That would, He was sad that the aborigines would be exterminated, but survival for like, of the fittest. That's like the weirdest reasoning to be sad about it. It's like yeah. even even PETA gets sad for better reasons than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's not, oh, we're so sad that this animal that is a living thing that feels pain is is dead and went through pain to get to death. It's, oh, it's really sad because now we won't be able to tell that, you know, the, the information that we've lost right. as yeah. a result of their extermination is so sad. Yeah. Not them being lost. Yeah, we will not be able to count visually count the steps from the animals to us because those steps will be gone and it'll just be a matter of recorded science and we won't be able to visually appreciate it's horrible. Awful. So there's that and 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 the uh, they added one more the ethnographic other which basically means other modern nations who may have our technology and seem to think like we do, but they're not us. They don't have our manners, our refinement, our way of looking at things. They're not true Western modern people. So they're kind they're of- They're Huns. Yeah, that, exactly. This racism, of course, and that's what it was. Although apparently the word racism wasn't coined until 1901 or two or something like that. Oh, wow. um, the, the, it was this implicit racism that that says- we are the measure of all things. True men are like us. And 
everyone else being not quite human, although we we believe in humanity, we're great humanitarians in the abstract. When it comes to individuals, if they're not like us, you know what? They're sacrificable. In the uh, early 1900s, we had this movement that began in America, although became famous in German, Nazi Germany, where we looked at certain types of pseudo-humans like Hispanics and Blacks and um, those who were mentally retarded or physically um, disabled and began to say, that's not healthy for the species. Now, why we should care about the species is kind of an open-ended question because if there's no God in heaven who says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, then why do we really care? Tangent off tangent, in, in that hideous strength, uh, there's a point where Lord Feverstone corners the protagonist, Mark. Oh, yes, and, in the in the biography, that hideous strength. Yeah. <laughs> documentary. Yeah, and um, uh, tries to get Mark to understand where the program of the bad guys is going. And Mark says, well, you know, ob- the future of the species, that's a pretty rock-bottom obligation. And Feverstone says... Why? No. Why should I care about some future eon of people I don't know, will never know, and may not even be like me? No, it's all about me right now and what I can get out of this. We're in a war and I like fighting and I like winning. You do, you do too, right? So let's 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 look at it as a more realistic way. And it's and in, in drawing that picture. An, hmm. It's such an interesting contrast too between Feverstone and um uh Weston in Out of the Silent Planet because yeah. Weston's entire motivation for it is I want humans to keep spreading across right, the galaxy right. and I want, you know, the future generations to take control of space before space comes and and wipes us out with its boot heel or something like that. <laughs> now Feverstone is just like, oh no, why do I care about the future? It's me. Yeah. It matters. Uh the the bridge is Paralandra, mm-hmm. where we Weston comes back and and tells Ransom, oh, I was a little narrow-minded then. I needed to see that all of life matters. The universe is, it's good Hegelian fashion. The, the universe is absolute. It is spirit. Uh, wherever it manifests itself, wherever it grows and develops, that's the, the but, but, but everything is part of that. Yes, but there are major trends, major currents, and to be there at the lead, that's what matters. And, and, and then that hideous strength, that, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <clears throat> as Lewis carefully chronicles the decline and fall of Western rationalism. It starts with, we can make a great, beautiful world for our children and grandchildren to, how can I use everybody to make me happy, prosperous, and, and give me power? He saw then where this was all going. Uh, we're seeing the outworking in our generation. But uh, untangenting off, off of the tangent. So uh, the eugenics movie, uh, the, the EU, you, uh, or EV, as an evangelical, means good. And uh, the genetic part means a good people or a good race. Mm. So eugenics is the science of how to produce a better race of humanity by scientific methods. And one of the most obvious things in any selective breeding program is to kill off the dead weight. Here, here is an animal with, with five legs. Well, let's not let it breed with anything. Here's a puny, weak animal. It doesn't need to be breeding with anything. Here's, here's something that's nearly blind. And what can it, here's one that's overly fat. Here's one that just doesn't look pretty like we wanted to. All these things need to go so that we can concentrate on breeding the best and brightest for whatever. Back then, there was still an emphasis upon humanity with humanity becoming more and more restricted to white intellectual Westerners who had graduated from the right universities and who were married into the right families. But as that has developed more and more, we've we've lost even that. Now, of course, the Nazis looked at what we were doing. You can think of Margaret Sanger here and Planned Parenthood and all of that. And if anyone out there still doesn't know, most of Planned Parenthood's clinics were set up in Hispanic and black neighborhoods because Margaret Sanger was a racist and um, wanted to eliminate those ethnic groups from the gene pool. They were a 
they were backward peoples who offered no hope for the future, had nothing to contribute. And so they needed to be stopped from breeding. And so go into these neighborhoods, make clinics readily available, and tell them, oh, you have far too many children. It's such a burden. You Look at this uh, husband. Your, your wife is suffering so much from having so many children, and you're not going to be able to take the children. Why don't you learn to, to cut it down to mere replacement value at best? Or maybe not at all. Um, and Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood uh, continues to do its work. I actually don't know. Did Sanger profess any allegiance to some kind of mainline denomination or denomination in any sense? Or was I she purely to, atheistic? I would assume the latter, but I've not read her biography. That is a good question. Maybe one we should look at before too long. It would be interesting just to talk about that whole thing sometime. I think I might just well, do the, that while we're continuing. Yeah, okay, you discuss. do that well. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's right. We have all information at our fingertips. What was I thinking? <clears throat> Anyhow, the Nazis looked at that and thought that looked really grand. But when World War II started and what the Nazis were doing came out, it no longer looked quite so grand, Holocaust and all. And the genetics movement in the United States faded or at least went underground and changed names and such. But that's where this kind of thing goes. When humanity becomes more and more narrowly defined, everything beyond humanity that's our new definition is sacrificable. We can, we can just get rid of it because it's in the way. Uh, or we can use it because maybe we need laborers for our new world order. People who are dull and dense, but at least can pull levers or pull boxes or something. Uh, just to pop back in, yeah. uh, the motto of the newspaper that Sanger owned slash ran mm -hmm. was A, called The Woman Rebel. And <laughs> B, the motto was No Gods, No Masters. So I think that answers. Okay, things. I think that yeah, that just answered the question really well. No gods, no masters, and what what was the 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 title of the paper again? Uh, the woman rebel. The woman rebel. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. In other words, the white upper class woman rebelling against everything that's been forced on her <laughs> by doing I'm serious harm to women of other sorts who weren't really women because they're not really human. Mm. Yeah, labels matter. Words matter. Uh, so that's where that's where anthropology has come. But the problem as 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 men and women from other nations and cultures have come to the West for an education or as Western education has reached them or whatever. Um, and they have become they've they've moved into this business of, of anthropology. Uh, they began to question this strangely enough. I am from India. I did not like your definition. I, uh, my grandfather was an aborigine in Australia. I was, there, there's something here that's not good. I'm from Japan. <laughs> that's not working for me. Uh, and, and, and so uh, anthropology, humanistic anthropology has had to retreat and say, well, we're just, you know, describing differences. But here's the difference. We have no way to evaluate these differences. We may note them. We may say Japan differs from China in this way, and China from Argentina in this way, and Argentina from Brazil in this way, and Brazil from South Africa in this way, and South Africa from Egypt in this way. And, and, and we can go on chronicling existing societies and past societies, but what we cannot do is make any value judgments. Originally, anthropology was all about value judgments <laughs> because we took ourselves as a starting point. Now, all we can do is, is, is make a list of differences, and at some point, someone's going to ask the question, well, you know, that's interesting. It's like looking at different kinds of flowers, and, but I like roses, and you like daffodils, and she likes daisies, um, and so, why, why, what, what judgments can we make? What, well, we can't because there are no absolutes here. Well, are we all human? Define human. Well, the humans are the um, yeah, We're the I, ones who do. <laughs> oh, yeah. What what what's the humans uh, are the ones who honor their de well? There's those cannibal tribes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's 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 no even when it comes to biology, and now the whole abortion issue kicks in. What are you going to say about the child in the womb? Is it human? Okay, well, we now define humanity as those outside the womb. Well, how about if they're halfway in and halfway out? Well, 
And, How and, do you and, have a human that isn't also a person? Yes. Yeah, and when, and that's that will that becomes rapidly the next question, which is of course just a shell game. All right, we admit that anything biologically descended from a human is human, but is this a person? Well, it's going to face exactly the same challenges. It's the same. For a while. It's functionally the same question. It is. <clears throat> We've tried because to get around it. Because a person is a human. I mean, not all persons are humans. Obviously, there's three <laughs> of them I can think of. But um, yeah, every person that you meet on the street or go to a distant country to shake hands with is a human being. Yes. And so now we shift toward away from functional definitions to sociological definitions, which is going to give us exactly the same problem again. Is that, okay, the child is a human being, but is it a human person? Has society granted it the rights of a human? See, the child may be in the womb society or maybe society granting a right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Contradiction in terms. Yes, because it's, it, it ceases to be a right. It is now a privilege granted by the majority. But who gave the majority the right to do all? Well, the society together banded together and gave itself this. You know, and, and some this of is this is a similar <laughs> argument to when people say that the Second Amendment was the government coming together to give itself the right to yes. wield guns. What? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is nonsense. It is circular. It is without foundation. It's it is. Sand. I just looked it up yesterday because I, I keep hearing the phrase begging the question. And mm -hmm. people use that phrase wrong all the time. But this oh, is yeah. literally begging this the is, question. This is literally begging the question. This is the, the actual fa fallacious argument. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go back to Eden, <laughs> where all things begin. When the serpent came to Adam and Eve and said, you shall be as gods. It was offering, he was offering them a chance to redefine themselves by their own choices. So, wow, this is the first time I've ever said that. So Satan was the first existentialist, which of course is obvious in retrospect, but I just never thought about it that way before. Um, and in defining themselves, they sidestep God's definition. God had said, you're my image, but you're my creature. They wanted to be not simply like God. They wanted to be God. They wanted to take on divine, not so much phenomenal cosmic power as it is the right, the ability, the authority to define right and wrong for themselves. You shall be as God deciding for yourselves what good and evil is. And in, in defining that, they made themselves the center of the universe. Each one of them made him herself the center of the universe, which is a problem because when you have two all-powerful beings in the same room, somebody loses. Uh, That's what, ultimately the the general problem with postmodernism is that you have six billion, seven billion, however many billions of people are on the planet right now, little gods running yeah. around, and supposedly each one has the power, authority, right to determine what reality means. Yeah. And right now, the only reason that that is working is because, for the most part, they've come to similar conclusions. <laughs> and that is not something the, – the, the, the phrase is, you know, it, the, the left is eating itself. Mm -hmm. There's also a fair amount of the right eating itself, but I'm <laughs> going to leave that alone for now. This worldview devours itself because eventually no. – you get to the point where, um, what's the word? Uh, friendly co-belligerency <laughs> is done. If you've won, oh, cool. We've defeated the enemies that we banded with these people against. Yeah. What are you doing exactly again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's all this and it, it works on a national level or international level. It works on the personal level. I think I am God. I may not say it that way, but I think I'm a normal, average Joe, and that everybody should more or less be like me. And people who are not like me, they're the ones who've got it wrong. And it can be from something as, well, they speak a different language, so <clears throat> obviously they're stupid. Um, their skin color is different. Well, obviously they're not exactly human then. 
um, they and you, you just go down the list of all the things that make people different, even down to well, they haven't had the kind of education I've had. Maybe they've had no education, so um, they they're a human failure. Maybe they're human somehow, but love them the way I love myself and people like me. Everyone who's like me <clears throat> is, yeah, us. But that becomes uh, constantly shrinks in number depending upon the, the circumstances and the conflicts involved. Sure, we'll side with Western Europe against the Far East, but then when that's dealt with, this is kind of what you were saying, when that's dealt with, then we look at people in Europe and say, they're, well, they're Europeans and they're funny and they think funny and yeah, we don't have, need anything. And, and then we start tearing ourselves apart. Okay, you from the South? Okay, you're not really one of us then, are you? You're from California. No. <laughs> You're not like anybody, whereas I, Californians, <laughs> okay, so the rest of the world doesn't get it, but we do. Somebody uh, came, was was talking to me in the grocery store several weeks ago, just like an, an older nice guy, and I mentioned something about like, you know, I'm not from around here, I'm not familiar with this brand, is it good? Because mm -hmm. I was looking at something on the shelf. He goes, oh yeah, it's really good, I got a bunch of them. Where are you from? And I go, California, and he immediately goes, ah, puts up his <laughs> fingers like a cross. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, California simply has, at the moment, the advantage of being potentially the, the sixth or seventh greatest nation on earth economically and in terms of, of hardware and such, if it were to separate from the union. It also has Hollywood, the movie industry, and all of that. If we, if, if however, we suddenly, if the California mentality were shrunk down to the size of, oh, I don't know, Utah, um, and, and, and lost its influence on the airwaves or uh, internet, I guess now. There's a question of how many people would actually follow us and how many people would say, let's build a wall around that and lock them in. Um, we, we, <laughs> I'm all for it. I was all for it when I lived there. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we come back to this definition of humanity. Uh, on the sixth day of the first week, God made man in his own image and granted a dominion over creation, the lesser creation. But he made man to love his neighbor, and first of all, of course, to love God. Man is that being who has a conscious, intelligible, intelligent relationship with the living God, but who is so far beneath him on the ontological scale that there is no comparison. God is infinite, man is finite, God is creator, Man is a created being, wholly dependent upon God, and yet God condescends in his overflowing joy, love, and mercy to make covenant with man, to bring him into a relationship in which he calls man not merely his servant, but his son. That's what makes man special. And when the Bible begins to talk about, to fill out this idea of the image of God, when Adam and Eve first heard this from God, they could look back at the creation work we has got to describe it and say, well... What does it mean to be like God? Well, obviously, we're not creators. Well, we kind of are. We kind of make things. And, and God made beautiful things, and we want, we want beauty. We want to beautify the garden. And God speaks, and we're talking to each other. God thinks and plans, and we've been making plans. Uh, and, they would, and, and God is able to discern that some things are better than others, and he delights in that which is good, and we've been taught to do that. Uh, Paul eventually will put the capstone on it in Ephesians and Colossians and speak of the image of God as righteousness, true holiness, and knowledge of the truth. Uh, and of course, Genesis adds with dominion over creation. These, are, these things are closely related to the Old Testament and uh, Christological offices of prophet, king, priest. To know and to speak the truth, to act in terms of it, to bring about relatively new things within the time stream. Uh, to change things, to make them better than they were, <clears throat> and then to rejoice with one another in that goodness, to bless and to enjoy and to fellowship. These are human things, and, and they are all related and done before the face of the living God, who is never absent from us. This is humanity. Yeah. And it's this that fell into sin. Now, in the fall, man did not become non-human, and in that sense, not less human, but the humanity was corrupted. If man stopped being human, God would stop caring about him as man and would stop holding him accountable. It was damaged humanity. It was damaged you know? humanity, yeah. Um, and what that has left us with, 
because we can't we cannot think in any other categories but biblical categories. We just twist them and break them and corrupt them. So we still have this idea of the of the um, the deranged, the depraved, the deviant. But now we fix on it not in terms of some moral absolutes given by God, but in terms of how unlike us they are. Mm. They're not like me. They're first of all, they're not like my nation. Or actually, they're not like my culture. They're not Western civilization. Wait, they're not American. Wait, they're not Californian. Wait, they're not part of my <clears throat> in-circle role-playing Bible study <laughs> uh, school we all came from pl- group. And, and so we get narrower and narrower and narrower. And, and it's couple- eventually just you. <laughs> yeah. And, but here's, here's the clever thing. We still have to have an idea of the devil. Because that, too, is an inescapable category. Once we have declared most of what God would call humanity as other, as non-human, we can put put our finger on something within that and say, and they specifically are the problem. Nazi Germany pointed primarily at uh, the Jews. Some Southern types have pointed primarily at the blacks. Uh, some blacks today point to the whites. Hmm? Or Northerners. Or Northerners, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants and vice versa. You know, we, we can find one group within our range of experience and say, they are the problem. Dr. Rush Jr. labeled the selective depravity. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a quote from him here. Depravity is limited to a class or group. Instead of seeing the problem of sin and of seeing the problem as sin, and sin as a pandemic to all men in Adam. Selective depravity sees sin as limited to a segment of humanity. Instead of fighting against sin, it calls upon us to fight against a particular group of men. This means a radically different plan of salvation than that which is set forth in Scripture. Instead of Jesus Christ as the Savior of all men, it sees one segment of humanity, the good guys, as the world's hope. The problem is to exercise the bad guys. And this this is something we are constantly seeing. And uh, of course, Marx capitalized this in his uh, approach to class struggle. Mm. Uh, the the oppressing class, the class that since to some degree controls the capital, they are the devil. They are the bad guys. And the way of salvation is to bring them down through bloody revolution and create a new order. And this keeps on going as, as uh, history progresses through economic dialectical conflict and of course but, it's not it's not a spiritual salvation it is no, no. it is the salvation of humankind the 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 workers who are you know these these noble men who do the hard thing and are being exploited and all that it's societal i've already said that but it's worth yeah. repeating this yeah, is it, there's nothing metaphysical about it, except right. in the sense that he thinks there is something behind history leading it towards the conclusion of communism. Yeah. Yeah. And and we're seeing it again today uh, in um, critical race theory, Black Lives Matter and all that, which are covers for old-fashioned Marxism, which is simply in, in every generation. And this this was Marxist ideology. Even before that, it was Hegelian and... and generally socialist, get people to fight with each other. It doesn't matter why. Find something. People always like to fight with each other. Find the, find the thing that works best. Develop a philosophy around that. Sell it. Sell it using Christian labels. This is justice. This is freedom. This is love. Because people, for some reason we don't get people such stuff with this, these Christian label people, things. So let's just use that. People like just breaking things honestly yeah. there is a i think carl truman said that um one of the reasons the reformation was as popular as it was and it's not necessarily a good motivation to get on the reformation side of things, but, <laughs> uh was that a lot of young men basically realized oh this is our opportunity to break stuff and so iconoclasm yes. was a thing who who who, being a 13, 14 year old uh, male child, uh, w- <laughs> would not relish the opportunity to uh, take a rock and throw it through a window that has a painting of something? Um, apparently, then more than today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but because in their culture, outward religious difference, whether or not you even understood the difference between Lord's Supper and Mass, mm-hmm. it's enough that. 
you've been told by your parents that those people who say mass are evil, wicked, and everything nasty should be done to them. And those people who say communion, Lord's Supper, whatever, yeah. they're the good people. It requires no understanding whatsoever. And it also helps to explain why over the course of the century since then, uh, there is the undercurrent of anything that even looks or sounds like it is in continuity with Catholicism, ooh, yeah. spooky fingers, is automatically wrong, automatically suspect. So we need to go away from it. That includes, uh, there's a, strong, uh, a growing in strength anti-creedal movement, uh, oh, yeah. anti-classical um, theism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These, these things that even the most maybe not the most radical reformers of the time, uh, the Anabaptists come to mind, but the more radical side would still <laughs> be like, some other no, 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 they too, were right yeah. about this. Like, we're we're disagreeing yeah. with them on the matter of sacramentology, ecclesiology, um, justification. Justification by faith or by imputed righteousness, or yeah. by uh, infused righteousness. And they still said they, they got this other thing right. But anyway, that's my yeah. mini soap. Uh, but you know, being a teacher and seeing not only my own class but the younger classes, it's it's amusing and yet very much concerning to see the younger kids fight over labels and not. Now, if you want, if you actually understand your church's commitment to one particular doctrine of baptism, and you can yourself defend it from scripture, and you want to have an argument with another kid on the other side who is in the same position with regard to his position, and you want to have a nice little debate. Great. Good stuff. Truth matters. But when all it's about is, well, we do it this way and you do it that way, so you're evil and stupid, blah, 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 blah. It's like, that's not love. There's no way that's love. Because it's or, not built or upon even truth. The, the very lazy argument, which again is is not in line with the truth, where you go like, well, obviously you just haven't reformed enough to yes. reject this clearly Catholic teaching, or vice yeah. versa to say, <laughs> well, clearly you've just deformed right out of the gate or something. It's like this yeah. isn't good faith argumentation. Yeah, yeah. It's just so you're just assuming off the bat that you and your crowd are right because it's you and your crowd. Um, I may be wrong, but that's not an argument. And we we need to go back to what the Bible actually says and read the text. What does it say? And read all of the text. And what does it all say? We're not going to just play to your few um, uh, superficial sentimental arguments that always seem to win because people don't know what don't know anything. Yeah. Um, it's just, but but b yes, all that and yet. Often it is our own sinful pride that rejects the other for being the other. Yep. Even into the very gates of the church, even at the altar, where we say, you just said altar, you're obviously Roman Catholic. No, I am not Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox, nor do I want to be, nor do I ever plan on being. Uh, I do actually understand the Roman doctrines of the sacraments and the Roman doctrine of justification. And I know a lot of Protestants who obviously don't. Mm. And I know a lot of Roman Catholics who don't either, um, because we we rest content with labels. Uh, do we want just of enough of a label to point out all the people who aren't like us so we can feel good about ourselves? Uh, and, and shifting ground completely here, I am reminded, because my family comes from the South, We do, my wife and I just saw a, a comedy routine on poor white trash. Nice. I don't know who the comedian, stand-up comedian was, but he was very funny and very accurate. Uh, but one of the things about the so-called poor white trash is that they had one thing going for them. They weren't black. Oof. Didn't have anything else going for them, and nor, nor did they particularly pretend to. They knew they were at the bottom of the social rung, but they weren't black. Black was something else again. I was going through some of my father's letters um, a few years back and picked up one from his sister who was in all respects, all other respects, a very godly woman, churchgoer, sweet, love the Lord, all that. But apparently a black family had moved into a house nearby. And the way she described it, I won't use the words, but you can guess. Um, and, and the callousness and the, well, there goes the neighborhood, was just absolutely horrifying to me. And she didn't write it as some kind of scathing attack. It was just the way she thought and talked. It because that's business it, as usual for her. Business as usual, because that's the culture she'd been raised in. And that's one of the reasons why people, when they suggest moving to the South, I'm just thinking, 
I'm sure there are God, many good godly people in the South, and I'm sure the South has progressed beyond that. But I, it, it's, it's kind of scarred me. I, I grew up with this, and it's, yeah, it's, it is not Christianity. Uh, yeah, I can tell one color of skin from another. Interesting thing, I can tell one color of skin from another, but I cannot read the DNA until now, thanks to Ancestry.com. <laughs> Not my, a not official sponsor of uh, <laughs> this show. <laughs> yes, but nonetheless, uh, I think our family members one by one bought each other birthday um, <laughs> gifts consisting of get yourself tested here. And we found out some amazing things. My wife had been told all her life that she was mostly Italian, but that her like, grandfather or something was pure blood Cherokee, as every uh, everybody else's grandfather in the United States is full blood Cherokee. Well... Her DNA comes back, no Cherokee whatsoever, no Italian, almost entirely Scottish, Welsh, English, and, and Viking. Wow. Northern, you know, that part of the world. Um, mine came back, and I had been told as a child that my birth father was um, um, Mexican-American, but that th what that meant was not clear. Does that mean he was from Mexico and moved to the, moved to the United States? Does it mean he was... Percentage wise, half Hispanic and half Anglo Saxon. I, I did not know, and so I would always tell my girls, "Well, on, on whenever you're having to list your ethnicity, put Hispanic because that's what I've been told." When I do this, it turns out I am uh, way over the um, the mark for being Hispanic, but not ex not generic Hispanic. My ancestors were from a, a small community outside Mexico City that the Aztecs never conquered. Um, wow. but apparently the conquistadors intermarried with them and basically no one in that area ever left that area until the 1920s, at which a point my immediate, uh, ancestors moved to the United States and, and into California and then into the Oakland area and I was born. But wow. going back further on my mom's side, uh, I have lots of ancestors in Salt Lake City. Mormons. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah, then I found out eventually my birth mother was Mormon. Like, oh, oh my birth father was had been Jehovah's Witness, but got um, cast out. Uh, <coughs> but as you look further, I, it also turns out that I have African blood from two or three different tribes and a small bit of Jewish blood. So what am I? I'm a child of God. And the other is interesting scientifically, genetically, seeing how... Mapping history and the movements of people groups, oh, that's all fine and fun. But my my grandpa on my mom's side always had a, a good response. Because this this was when immigration was still a very strong thing. And people would come and say, well, what, what, what nationality are you? And grandpa would say, tell them American. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's funny because in our school where we have a mix of so many different uh, Eastern European people groups, even when the families are nationalized, they've taken they've taken the, the the citizenship oath. Their children are nationalized. You ask them what are they, they will say Russian, Ukrainian, Lovan, Romanian, not well, we're American, but our ancestors were. No, in their minds, the that that grouping still holds. And so when Russia invaded the Ukraine, we have Russian and Ukrainian families and kids. That was interesting for a little yeah. while. Whose yeah. side do you pick? Um, and do you have to pick a side? Can't you rather stand on Jesus' side and say, whoever is doing evil here is wrong, and they both need Jesus? Um, but that's that's the basis for the gospel, that humanity is not, label, it's not shut off in selective herds where some people need the gospel, other people maybe need something else, and some people can just burn because they're beneath our notice. Uh, it, I've been reading a book on the... Um, the beginning of missions after the Reformation, the renewal of missionary activity. And it, it is amazing to me to see how many with good, solid Calvinistic theology had trouble getting this whole missionary thing through their heads. And it's like, well, they're not really our culture. It's going to be really hard to teach them the faith when they don't know English. Um how are we supposed to communicate with them? And is it really necessary that we do? I'm, can't God find something? Uh, they're not like us. And it took some very strong leaders to say, hey, how about we go and live among them and learn their language? 
and then preach Christ to them in a way that they can understand without diluting the faith, but but communicating it in, in their terms. I don't know about that. But it was eventually that that eschatological optimism that fueled the missionary revivals of the 1700s and 1800s. But it took a while, and it was still part of this, but they're them and we're us, and how, why? Um, this is something Christians really need to get beyond. And I, in many respects we have. I've, I've said before that oftentimes when the church works itself into a dead end or ignores a doctrine or a teaching or reality long enough, God will raise up a counter movement in the world, which will analyze the problem pretty closely, pretty well, then give us the most horrible solutions possible. <laughs> like I think you're the one who added that one. But this is a chastisement. It gets us going again. Uh, and I, I, I would love to be able to say the church is the one who led us to understand that men who seek God in all nations are acceptable to him. I'm not so sure that was it. I have an idea it was a little bit of um, the cultural relativism that came out of the left, but the one that challenges us to get over your whiteness and start looking at men as men. The world took that in completely the wrong direction. Yeah. But I think it shook us up enough that well, there came a generation, I'm probably beginning about with mine, where race became a non-thing. It's not a biblical concept remotely. And the difference in this, differences in ethnicity became not simply challenges, but also wonderful opportunities and a delight to see how God had prepared this people in this place to hear the gospel. If only we would go and tell them. Uh, and abandon our assumptions and our privileges for a little while. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, is what Paul did wherever he went, becoming all things to all men. I'm not sure I have anything really to add. I mean, <laughs> just... That's a I kind of I an think, up note. <laughs> I think the only thing I would say in addition is um, the double-edged warning to one... Well, it's really a single edge, and it's have discernment but there's a, a difference between like just having discernment and then like being incredibly hyper discerning against mm. error to the point that you can't listen to anyone at all because yes. everyone has a problem about something yes. um, so like when it comes to the issue of race uh which is, is you know a not really biblical category necessarily no, necessarily no, it's it's, not. it's something new it's something that yeah. we can acknowledge and say like this is a thing that people see like right it, people that, talk about this and they use these categories but they're yeah. not rooted in scripture so racism it's a sin like we need to yeah. obviously I, you and i are on the same page about racism being a sin but <laughs> yeah. um there's people who who look at influential theologians in the past and give their racism like they just kind of brush it aside. At best, they don't mention it and don't think about it. Mm -hmm. At yeah, worst, do you, do you have a specific example there to make that clear? Ooh, I have two spicy examples. Okay, um, go for it. The first would be Martin Luther, who later mm -hmm. in life was very, very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Not just anti-Judaistic, but anti-Jewish. Right. For yeah. all of the great things he did, he was yeah. still a sinful man. And we can obviously look at him and say, "Yeah, this is this is what he did." Acknowledge it, and then say, "But he was still biblically accurate on X, Y, and Z issue." Right. And the second one, which is also spicy, is uh, R.L. Dabney. Oh yeah. Who wrote uh, in uh, what's what's it called? Uh, it's either a defense or in defense of Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Sh uh, shortly after the Confederacy separated from the Union. And the absolute horridness of mm -hmm. the way he refers to black image bearers is awful. And the way that he yeah. continued to through the rest of his life, yeah. even to the point of the, I think it was the PCA at that point still, um, having a discussion in eight, after, the, after the war, considering the issue of bringing on uh, black ministers. Mm -hmm. And he essentially said, they're all lazy. They're all too stupid. And if we lower our standards to let these people in, then there'll be no ministers left in good standing uh, who are, you know, worthy of the title minister. So I vote against this. Yeah, it's not good. That's no, that's that's wrong. Not. And for that's, all his yeah. other systematic correctness when it came to different yeah. doctrines, that was wrong. Same as Martin Luther. We we don't have yeah. 
idols or heroes in Christianity, uh, unless you count Jesus. Like, <laughs> and we will count it. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I can think of 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 theologians, writers who I respect on for much of what they've done. But yeah, the same kind of thing has come up. And sometimes it's because they were a product of their time and using the language of their time. Yeah. I am still shocked in, momentarily <laughs> when I'm reading something from the 50s or 60s and someone simply uses the word Negro, but oh, yeah. it's obviously not simply a descriptor of skin color or even of culture. It's like these are a different sort of people. They don't say that, but it's almost impossible for me to read what they've written without hearing that. Yeah, but and yet that was how black people were spoken of, and and now is is black even acceptable? Are, are we are we still at African American, or is that even work? Because not all people with black skin, or dark skin came from Africa. Um, mm -hmm. There is such a thing as being too touchy, but there's also such a thing as going back and saying these were people living in a different time under different conditions, and insofar as possible, we need to discern what those what the intentions were. Yeah. Were they were they really forwarding uh, a message of hate, or were they just being careless because they were adopting the language and, and and thought forms of the time to communicate something very different, often very hostile to those very thought forms? Yeah. Uh, the, the the touching of you know Huck Finn. Do you read it in class? Because it uh. has the in, the N word. Well, when I was a kid, the N word was not called the N word. We actually used it. I didn't know any black people growing up, and um, it, it, it was, it was a, a common word. As I got older and realized it was a very offensive word, I stopped using it. Um, I do believe you should call people what they want to be called because it's respectful. Yeah. Even if sometimes you have to go a little ways to figure out what that might be this year. Um, but um, so the, the, the two things, let's not be overly picky. And, and, and consider that maybe people are uneducated or speaking out of a different time and place. And yeah, let's not be afraid to call our heroes on the carpet and say, yeah, you were so good with Dabney. Your systematic theology is so good. This is atrocious. Yeah. And I suspect Jesus had some words with you about this uh, as you appeared before him in glory. It's, it's not like all navigating all sin and righteousness issues. It's not always easy because our, even as saints, our understanding is clouded by sin and by self. We still think of ourselves as the center of the universe. And Jesus spends all our lives working on that in us. And only death or his return gets us past that holy. But we can at least devote ourselves to the principle that we're not the center of the universe. God is. Yes. And God has made many people who are very different from us in many ways. And they are human. They are the image of God. And they need Jesus too. And part of our responsibility is to love them by taking Jesus to them, or bringing them to him. Exactly. And so the, the ending message we would leave you with is, be like the little girl in Second Kings. Mm -hmm. Who who saw even one who was oppressing her as a as one of God's people and still said, "Man, if only he was there near the prophet, so that he could be healed of this sickness." Oh, and the last line, the prophet did heal him. Jesus will say there were many lepers in Israel, but unto none of them was Elisha sent, but to this one Syrian, this one Gentile. So, the little girl was right. She's a better theologian than a lot of people today. <laughs> well, what an excellent note to end on. Thank you for joining me for this, Greg. Do you have a recommendation? Yeah, uh, this is a, this is a somewhat guarded recommendation because I haven't finished reading the book yet, which is something we tend to do a lot. I did uh, it last week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, recommendation by proxy. You go read this and tell us what you think of it. When I was when I was still in high school, I was told of a book. Um, as the Waters Cover the Seas by James uh, DeYoung. Uh, it is the story of the beginning of Anglo-American missionary activity. Uh, and some of the things I mentioned actually come from the book. I've heard of it for years and years and years. Uh, back before the internet, it, it was not a book you could find. Actually, the man who wrote it was a theology teacher at my college, and there were many areas of theology I very much disagreed with him on, but he's a good historian. Uh, and it, it is, it is. I think his his probably his doctoral th thesis. Um, 
and it's written like one. So this is not a book for everybody, but if you're interested in how the idea of the Reformed Church reaching out to the world, to other nations beyond Scotland, England, and America came about, and the motivating factors and the prophecies and how people interpreted prophecy differently and what those differences made as the church became more self-consciously missionary-oriented, that this would be a, a good book for you. It's, it's, it's readable. It's not, it doesn't read like a novel, certainly. But if that's an interest of yours, As the Waters Cover the Seas by James DeYoung and the young is uh, D J O N G. That's ah, your name. Gotcha. I'm going to follow up my recommendation from last week uh, or last episode, I guess, uh, to say yes. I finished the book about ah. Peter Pan being the bad guy, and I can confirm it is good. The ending <laughs> is good. It was a good story overall. Very sad in a lot of is ways. It, but was it titled The Lost Boy or The Lost Boys? Uh, I think it's just it's. Lost Boy. Okay, Lost Just Boy. Okay. By that. And the uh, the art uh, artist, the author's name is Christina Henry. She's apparently okay. also written several other books that take like fairy tale stories and tell it in a slightly more, you know, the, the non Disney fied version of them. Mm-hmm. There, there's at least, I think there was one about Alice in Wonderland, even. And Ooh. I don't know what the premise of that one is. I just saw the cover on uh, Goodreads when I was typing up my review. Uh, Well, uh, thank you for the recommendations and thanks for the conversation. This was good. Thank you as well to you for joining us. Uh, If you'd like to follow us, if you don't already, you can do so on our YouTube page through Rumble. Uh, You can like our Facebook page. uh, And if you uh, like the show and want to subscribe to the show, uh, you can do so through any podcast catcher that's out there. Uh, We should be on all of them. If you'd like to reach out to us, uh, you can do so at our email, haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Send us questions, comments, tell us thanks, whatever you want. It doesn't need to be anything. You don't need to. (laughs) But you could invite other people to listen. Yeah, you can invite other people to listen and uh, send us questions. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Thank you as well to our financial supporters. You help us get the the show out to you, and uh, it's it's really a a great blessing to us. Uh, If you would like to join our supporters, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And finally, a thank you to David Maxson, our producer, for getting the episodes edited and out to our listeners. Thank you so much again for joining us. We look forward to having you join us next time. Bye-bye.